Good evening. My name is Kristen Brown, and this is a roundtable talk. We have a special guest tonight, Trustee DeSalvo. I just want to go over a few meeting norms because this is a roundtable discussion, which means it's not a webinar. You are in control over your microphone. Um, so we will open up for a Q&A after a brief discussion with Trustee DeSalvo. If you have a question in the in between, though, do raise your hand and we'll, we'll try to um, address your question. Um, if, or you could post it in chat and I could add it to the questions I'm asking. Just, um, there's going to be a lot of you, so uh, maybe it will be better for you to put it into chat. Um, I want to welcome our special guest, Trustee DeSalvo. He was elected to Santa Clara County Board of Education in 2008. And he's been reelected in 2012, 2016, serving as the board president in 2010 and 2011. Um, he began his 33 year career in education as a teacher at Osborne School and Juvenile Hall, a Santa Clara County Office of Education School. He's been a teacher, director, ele elementary and middle school principal in the county, as well as serving as union president for Santa Clara County teachers. He's also served for three years as a personal commissioner for the Santa Clara County Office of Education. In 2001, he was recognized as the Association of California School Administrators, Region 8 Administrator of the Year. He's, he's uh, running again, and I'm hoping that we get to keep him because I've really appreciated everything that Trustee DeSalvo has done in a very student-centered way. And I appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, I think we should begin, though, uh, if you could, Trustee DeSalvo, explain what authority a County Board of Education trustee has so that as a community, we don't have any assumptions. Sure, Kristen, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to be with your, um, your, your other colleagues um, <laughs> on, this, uh, on this extraordinary time that we're all living through. This is in my 68 years of life. This is the the most unique time that I feel so unsettled in so many ways. And, and that's, that's an unusual feeling for me. But I, again, I appreciate this opportunity to be with you and your, um, your colleagues. Um, the county office. So by the way, let me just say that I did not run in 2012 and 16. I was automatically elected because nobody sought the seat to the seat that I have, which is trustee area four, representing most of Santa Rosa Unified, about 30% of Oak Grove School District, and the corresponding portion of Oak Grove to the East Side Union High School District. That's my trustee area, about 135,000 registered voters in that trustee area. <clears throat> the first time I ran in 2008, there were about 112,000 registered voters. So the trustee area has increased um, since then. So you want me to discuss uh, a little bit about what the role of a county trustee is. And, and please, for your, for your guests, if they could just call me Joseph. Joseph is fine. Uh, let's not uh, um, stay with the formalities. I know that you have, Kristen, but just call me Joseph. That's the name I go by uh, in my professional world at the county office. My family calls me Joe, but everybody else calls me Joseph that I work with at the county office. <clears throat> so the, the, tr the county office is an interesting animals. We do have overarching authority to school districts for three issues. We're called um, an appellate body for three distinct school issues. And they are, if you wanted your child to go to another school district other than San Jose Unified, mm -hmm. um, and that and San Jose Unified denied you from doing so, let's say you wanted to do that because there was a unique program of Latin taught it at a school in Palo Alto. And you work in Palo Alto when you wanted to go the Palo Alto Unified School District, and you live in San Jose Unified. You would appeal first to the districts, and if they deny it, the county board has a hearing in closed session usually uh, and listens to that appeal. We approve quite a few of our, um, our inter-district attendance appeals uh, because parents usually know what's best, and most of the majority of us believe um, that we should, we should do so, unless there's ex extraordinary circumstances that say, we should not. The other is expulsion hearings. Mm -hmm. So we're an appellate body for an expulsion. If a district expels a student, and we just had one recently from a district 
uh, our last board meeting uh, at the end of the month, uh, end of May, <clears throat> the third Wednesday in May, that is. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually overturned on a 7-0 vote that expulsion because of some, some issues with the proceedings of that district. <clears throat> and that trial was represented by, by um, public counsel. Um, and uh, so that is another thing the county does. So interdistricts, uh, expulsion hearings. And then the last one is charter schools. Okay. And if a district denies a charter that comes to them, the county board could approve the charter on appeal. And we've done so um, quite a few times. We have approximately 10,000 students currently in charter schools that we've approved, either on a countywide charter basis or on a district denial, we've approved them. <clears throat> Our board is a little different than the configuration that approved those charters right now. I'm not, I don't believe that would be the case uh, on the board, the present board, county board, that we would approve um, charters on appeal from school districts. <clears throat> um, so the county superintendent is hired by the county board, <coughs> which is our chief responsibility, I believe, in addition to, of course, budget and policy. But that superintendent that we hire is supposed to be the voice of all the children that live in the county. Um, so that you see Dr. Dewan, Marianne Dewan, our current superintendent, doing a lot on, on COVID-19. You referenced, Kristen, in your questions for me, the fact that there's a survey. And I'm gonna to try to find out when that survey and the results of that survey will be, will be done on COVID-19 and what parents want for distance learning next year. So I'll get back to you on the date I wasn't able to find out prior to this. Okay. So that's the role that I, I think that uh, the county board is, is uniquely different. The other way we're uniquely different is school district boards. Kristen, when you're, when you're on that San Jose Unified Board, you will have responsibility for, for hiring and then letting go teachers if there's a, if there's a reduction in force mm -hmm. process or teachers for disciplinary reasons you, reasons, you would hear those things in closed session from the superintendent. The county board is uniquely different. There are 58 counties in California, mm -hmm. and 53 of the superintendents in the counties are elected. Hmm. And there was a time when I was a teacher association president that my group uh, wanted to have our county superintendent elected rather than appointed. There are five counties where the, the superintendent is appointed, mm -hmm. and we are one of those. And it goes back to historic um, uh, issues with the County Board of Supervisors and how that all developed. But suffice it to say, our superintendent is appointed by the County Board, but there's an Attorney General opinion of 2002, it's an mm -hmm. opinion that says the County Board cannot be um, responsible for hiring anybody else in the County Superintendent. So if the County Superintendent wanted to hire a Deputy Superintendent tomorrow, she, she at the present, could do so without ever consulting the county board, which is so unlike a school district. Right. Um, I believe that's not in the best interest of everybody since I've had um, people tell me, including uh, a lot of um, legal people, Lou Lozano being one of them, mm -hmm. that the judges would rule, if it ever was taken and contested in court, mm -hmm. the, the, the Superior Court judge would rule on the on the electeds because they're the closest to the people. But when you have an elected superintendent, an elected board, there's a conflict. Who's really, uh, the county superintendent is usually elected at large. Mm. County trustees are elected oftentimes in trustee areas. So um, it, is, um, it is problematic. That's why the attorney general has an opinion that we can't be involved in anything to do with, with hiring staff. That's the county superintendent role. Mm -hmm. uh, once we hire the county superintendent, it is he or she that hires the, the staff. And we don't have anything to do with collective bargaining, even mm -hmm. though the teachers union, which is in this case called the Association of County Educators and Service Employees International U Union 521, believe we do have a decision and they come to us and advocate for their health and welfare benefits and, and uh, wages and other contract provisions. We have absolutely nothing to do with that, according to the AG opinion. So it's the county superintendent. So our role is not as full 
mm -hmm. as a, a trustee from a school district. So That's interesting. it is fascinating, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, you know, we're at this time that school closures, it's, we're on the summer break, but it, the closures itself seem to catch most school districts unprepared and with little warning. And I'm wondering what you noticed uh, with a, a broader view of more of the county. Um, how did the districts in the county appear in readiness with the closure that when it was announced on March 13th? I think some were prepared more than others, as should be expected. Okay. Um, I do think that San Jose Unified was, as I stated publicly, based on my anecdotal information from a lot of different people, a lot of different sources, that they were slow initially to respond. Um, I was hearing that from the neighborhood on my 10,000 step walk a day and, and mm -hmm. my, my neighbors, uh, and they were inquiring about why that was so. San Jose mm -hmm. Unified said, after I had said that, I had 31 public comments addressed to me at the next meeting, mostly from the administrators in San Jose Unified, that were concerned about what I said. And, and their position was they were trying to take care of um, the uh, nutrition issues first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And it is true that San Jose Unified is the largest district, uh, over 32,000 students mm -hmm. in our county. Um, and certainly I could understand how that would have been uh, a primary responsibility they felt. Mm -hmm. um, I also have heard, or at least it was in a, I heard this and I read it in a, in a uh, San, San Jose spotlight piece a few months back, that they believed it was not going to be something that was going to last, that people would return in a couple of weeks to yeah. school. And that was a, a supposition that turned out to be wrong. And because of uh, those two things, they got off to a slower than, I'm sure, a slower start than they, they wish they would have. Um, I do think there are a lot of issues that distance learning creates for school districts, mm -hmm. one of which is making sure that those who are home have the necessary hardware and, and access to the internet that they need. In fact, uh, in a recent webinar the county did last week with Mayor Sam Licardo, with um, Dave Cortese from the Board of Supervisors mm -hmm. and with our superintendent and some library people. Marianne Dewan said that for this to work next year, it's not just a delta of 15,000 um, computers or tablets, mm -hmm. it's 44,000 just in, I, I think that was Santa Clara County, although this was a San Jose kind of focused on, well, it was focused on both San Jose because Mayor Ricardo was involved and the county because Dave Cortez was involved. So 44,000 because there are multiple children at home, um, siblings that need the same thing at the same time. So I, I had never thought about that until the, the actual um, webinar, that, uh, webinar that was done. Um, so I think there were school, some school districts, Kristen, that yeah. got on things right away and were more prepared and those were Milpitas Unified, uh, Canva Elementary um, were two that, that, that come to mind. And Franklin McKinley, I think I've, I've seen reported in, in the media, also did uh, a reasonably good, good job according to, to uh, anecdotal data that I have and things that I have read. Can you um, share some of the stories that you've been hearing from parents and teachers about you know, the remote education experience that impressed you? It's been really checkered. Uh, the, what I've heard, it's been checkered. Um, sometimes good. It's really predicated on the quality of teacher with the um, with the skills to mm -hmm. do remote learning. I, I think it's WebEx that San Jose Unified uses. Is that correct? That's correct. And most districts are using Zoom, where you could mute students in WebEx. I don't think that's possible, and parents to me have complained about that, that some teachers don't know the actual management structure of a Zoom class. And it makes it sometimes appear to some of my parents that I've talked to, like it's the class is out of control since it can't be muted. Okay. But it's really, um, I've participated on an invitation uh, by trustee uh, Michael Sai in Milpitas Unified 
okay. on a Zoom class of a middle school. This was a middle school teacher who was said to be the quintessential uh, Zoom teacher. And he, did a, he was doing a lesson. And so I was able to be an interloper to that lesson. And it was, it was fascinating. It, the, the, um, he, he kept it very much similar to what it probably would have been in his classroom where the students had to write at the beginning of class to a prompt that he had on, on his screen. Okay. So I'm sure it was on either, his, his, either on a screen, uh, in focus projector or on his, on his, on his blackboard or chalkboard, but he um, had it on his screen on his computer and they were responding to the prompt for 10 minutes. And they were writing for 10 minutes and then responding to the prompt and he put them in various groups so that they could discuss what they wrote and then go, go back to the, to the larger group. Um, mm -hmm. he, he was very talented. He also had a, an ability to, which he uses obviously in his classroom, to randomly select students. So it was a wheel with all the students' names participating in the Zoom. So it automatically, those participating automatically were part of the wheel. Mm -hmm. And wherever that wheel stopped, just like a game show, I'm looking at Mike Flynn's name or uh, Christina Cole's name, mm -hmm. um, or Suzanne Knapp's name, you wouldn't know that I'm gonna be calling on you in the wheel if it stopped on your name, you would have to respond. So it was, it's, it was that anticipatory set that was really kind of, kind of cool for, for me and for the students, because I think random questioning is, is, is something that is a, a good uh, teaching tool. Okay. So um, I observed in San Jose Unified, a Reed Elementary School. It was called International Day. Did anybody participate in that or no. know about that? It was phenomenal. Mm. And the principal, Nate, um, let me call him Nate because I can't find his, uh, his, his last name. Maybe I can if I look. Ramazani. Okay. Nate, um, probably mispronouncing that, but Nate invited me to participate probably because I was even though I wasn't critical of Santa's Unified, I, I did state that I've heard that they're near the bottom of responses in an early time of the, the changeover to distance learning. Um, and I, I, did, I didn't know, I said that I told my board and the county superintendent that we need more information about this. Let's try mm -hmm. to, to study this and understand what the issues are and then plan accordingly as a county office for um, that all school districts and children could get distance learning. One of the things that let me go back to um, to the person in Los Angeles who was doing the Zoom Zoom class that I was I was observing with the random uh, question. He said that attendance was an issue when I asked that question before his Zoom class, and he was concerned about that. He said it was over ten percent of his students were not participating and um, in Zoom classes on a regular basis, and he didn't know how that could be worked out, but I would be concerned about that as well. And I think we need to take, take some, uh, some information about and find out whether, how true that is um, and, and, and try to plan accordingly and try to address that delta. Go ahead, Kristen. The, trying to, there's questions popping up already. Um, let me see. Uh, you can take them if you wish as you go along. That would be fine with me. Uh, um, Thurman has issued the basic guidelines today. Did you have a chance to look at those or, or who that? issued the basic guidelines? Yes. Uh, Tony Thurman. So this is the CDE. Okay. I got it. I got it. The state yeah. superintendent issued the guidelines for distance learning. I haven't had a chance to look at those. Okay. Yeah. They were just issued today. He was, um, yeah. So the question that, ultimately became what, what authority will San Jose Unified School District be given to enforce these regulations? And my, my understanding from the presentation is, is all local agencies will uh, use those as guidelines and do their own. I've, I've not heard anything different from that. Have you? Yeah, I, I have not either. Okay. I think, again, it's local control, just like local control funding formula. I think that the state would, 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 um, turn it back to the to the local districts to do what they think is right based on a certain overarching guidelines. Right. Thank you. Um, 
I've, I've heard from some parents who've noted that the remote learning has their child thriving and engaging in learning like they haven't before. I understand this isn't across the board, but I'm wondering if there's some aspects of the current remote education you would like to see staying in place as we move forward. Well, I think it's, it's, it's imperative that I was trying to think of a ratio that would be fair if I was a, uh, a principal and my staff was required to do distance learning for all of 2020-21, mm -hmm. what would be the ratio of preparation time, professional mm -hmm. development time, learning time that I would think would be best for the, the teacher as well as the student in the learning process? And I was thinking of one-on-one uh, -on -one ratio. If there's three hours of Zoom time, there mm -hmm. should be probably at least early on in the process, three hours of preparation time. If there's four hours of Zoom, Zoom time, um, then um, four hours of preparation time. There was some, some talk about extending the school day to mm -hmm. account for the losses of this last year, next year. Um, but I, I would think that would be fair in, in to both teachers and students because it's really the quality of lessons it's, it's um, it, I think in this case, less is maybe more if the quality is, is really good. Uh, I know one of the issues seems to be in things that I read and things that I hear, uh, parents trying to help and having the time to help. Um, yeah. and, and that's been one of the checkered issues. Um, some are able to do it. Some are on their own Zoom with their own work life eight hours, 10 hours a day, and don't have time to, to be at those lessons with their children. One of my neighbors has even hired their, um, their au pair back to, they, they, because they were both home working from uh, in the high tech world, um, they, don't, they didn't have a need for an au pair, but brought her back so she could help with the lessons. I think ideally it's, it's every child needs needs help uh, mm -hmm. once the teacher is done with their lessons. Um, and many children, more of those with some privilege of having parents at home that can help mm -hmm. um, get their needs met and those who don't have parents home don't. And that I think exacerbates the issues of the achievement gap that, that we will have going forward. And mm -hmm. that has to be addressed in yes. conversations with school boards um, mm -hmm. and teacher unions um, and budgeting, how you budget for those. But I think, a, I, I think professional development is really key and mm -hmm. that teachers, those who are, are digital natives um, do it better than those that aren't digital natives, those in, in the latter part of their career, it seems like, mm -hmm. although that's not always the case, but those that are digital natives and have, been born with this technology, um, just like the Reed Elementary School International Day lesson that I saw with a phenomenal teacher that organized that for her class. I just saw one class, but the school had some, um, some uh, interspersed videos that were used, like the fifth grade singing the national anthem at the beginning of International Day, even mm -hmm. though this was a, a second grade class I was observing. I don't know if I answered your question, but I'll take another one if there's. You did, you did. Um, so you, uh, let's see, the hybrid model you already sort of talked about, but it's not really defined. Um, the CDE remarks, any hybrid model will need to be determined by local needs. What local needs do you want to assure are met in a hybrid model for, for this local area? High th local needs of a hybrid model. Um, yes. So that would be both in classroom and then having time that you're doing remotely. Yeah, I, I think that I think the remote learning has to have an adult that could, because parents are not always available or, or older siblings are not always available if it's an elementary child, mm -hmm. has to have an adult maybe at a ratio of one to 10 or one to 20 that could answer questions um, during that time. So students have access to a Zoom tutor, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that that's something in the hybrid model that should be thought about in some way. 
And I think that could be done with mm -hmm. um, or volunteers who, if not a paid professional staff member or a classified employee of the district right. or a teacher that may be working with district office on a special assignment, mm -hmm. be uh, at least for this hour of time on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, um, there's children have access to a tutor. They, I love they that. could ask questions of. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm hearing how robust the county survey was, and I experienced that it was too. And you you touched upon at the beginning because um, I was going to ask about the the data on the survey when it'll be reaching the board of Edu the Santa Clara County Board of Education. Yes. And if there is an area that interested you the most, you'd already commented that that the reveal is not a date that's been given yet, so you don't know. But um, I will find out and get back to you, and then you can send it out to your group. Was was there an area of that survey that you were hope that you're most interested in? Did you get to look at the survey? I did. I do. I have it in front of me now. Okay. And and. Um, I think the questions that are about just like which full time in person student learning, I, I'm curious how many parents, what percentage of parents are saying full time in person student learning, and what portion are saying hybrid, or what portion are saying full time distance learning. Yeah. You know, if it's a third, a third, a third, that's going to be fascinating for us to try to grapple with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's yeah. probably not going to be full time. I'm thinking there's a lot of parents giving pause to having their children with the ongoing COVID-19 issues. Um, and the fact that they're going to have to be with the same group and a smaller group. And the fact that teachers may have to be wearing masks, which I, I, from my, my educator days in a classroom, I know that many students, many of my friends use, use lips to read from a distance. And so that's concerning to, to me. Um, so amplified sound perhaps would be important for teachers. But I'm really concerned uh, about how this is going to break out. And do you have any or do your, do your guests have any um, knowledge of how that's going to go or what their guests would be? Because I'm really curious to find out those results, as you are. Yeah. Um, let's see. There I, let me go back in the comments here. There's Janica Clem's on the call. Janica, you're not showing your face. Hi, Janica. I just saw your name pop up. She's muted, so she can't say hello. She can unmute herself, though. Um, Hi, Janica. I do. Wow, great to great to see your name pop up. Oh, nice Thanks for being with us. Of yeah, course, great. my pleasure. All right. So I'm sorry, Kristen. It's okay. <laughs> Did you want to weigh in on that, Janica? He was asking about the, the yeah. remote from hybrid. The so um, just to give people on the call context, I've got um, six-year-old twins, so they just <laughs> finished kindergarten. Oh, congratulations. A Zoom, that was my comment. Zoom calls with kinders is, uh, with 25 of them is almost pointless. But um, yeah. what I am curious, what I'm really curious about is I've been following the science a lot and we're see seeing that rates of COVID in children is like 0.02%. Yeah. Um, and it's just, the children are not as susceptible to this disease uh, it, from what we know right now. Um, with that stated, I feel that watching what other countries are doing and how they're going back to school, my nephews are now back in school in Switzerland, and mm -hmm. seeing how we can take the lead of those, and in Australia too, they just started their school year, um, how we can see how they um, are doing and, and take the uh, information and lead from them as far as getting our kids back in. I think it's the adults in the, in the classrooms and the adults in the schools that we really need to be um, cognizant of, but I'm actually not um, as fearful for the kids. The, the thing I'm more feel, fearful for, again, two six-year-olds, is the social emotional piece of them just being away for so long and not having interaction with other children and other adults than I am the actual like um, pandemic that's happening. So there's my comment. Well, I, I think that you're gonna be part of that majority that believes that, because I think that that is what the data, that is what the scientists are saying uh, and the medical experts. Um, but I think that, there's going to be many issues with um, staff, um, mm -hmm. and there's going to be many issues with how how many to have at a certain place. The fact there has to be maybe three uh, lunch times and three break times, 
um, in the, the fact that you're going to have to go in one direction on campus uh, as you do in a, in a uh, grocery store. It, it, there's a lot of things to sort out. And um, I think we've got a couple of months to get those sorted out. But it's because it's going to be hectic, certainly, mm -hmm. I think that I'm thinking that probably, at least in my neighborhood, um, there is going to be at least 30% that are going to keep their children, um, find another, e either homeschool their children or do something similar, or yeah. maybe teach their children mm -hmm. in small groups with parents taking the role of teacher. I don't know. Rather than having them in that kind of environment that's going to be, that's going to be confusing, it's going to be new. I don't think it's going to be risk. Joe, you bring up a good point. Yeah, you bring up a good point because there are now statistics coming that private schools that used to see 200 applications a year are now seeing 700. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, I fear for what will happen with um, public funding for education that which I, you know, we all know that it's the funding that's really dependent um, for how uh, successful the schools are. And then you add the equity issue and you've got a whole nother layer. Um, but yeah, so it will be curious to see who does come back and what it does look like. Um, but I do fear that we're going to have a flight of some of our more well-resourced families to different educational opportunities. I do. I do as well. I think that's a really valid point and one that concerns me as, as well. And, you know, as districts, districts get money. Those who are apportionment districts, not basic aid districts, they get mm -hmm. money for every, for every child that attends. So right. they're not attending, the, 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 the money that the district receives could drop precipitously. So then that was one of Tony Thurman's asks was that we specifically look at the ADA guidelines and have better flexibility this year on that for that very reason, right? He doesn't want that to impact as, as much as it could. And that would be good. That would be good. Yeah. Basic um, aid so districts, and half of our districts in Santa Clara County are basic aid districts. Santa's Unified's almost there mm -hmm. to be a basic aid district and not an apportionment district. Um, they would be there when the city of San Jose um, pays off a lot of their uh, redevelopment debt um, because that once that redevelopment debt is paid off, that redevelopment, those redevelopment dollars go back to school districts in large measure. They go back to certain taxing uh, agencies like library, uh, water district, but schools and community college get a major piece of those, of those dollars that went to redevelopment. Would you unpack that a little bit? Because I remember in one of our early conversations, you brought that up and it was mind blowing to me that we were, that that's, you know, when people say my tax dollars should be going into the schools to say, I, you need to watch those tax dollars and see. I think it was six cents of every tax dollar. And don't quote me. Um, okay. I know James Williams County Council would correct me because he's the one that coached me on this. <laughs> but I think it was six cents of every tax dollar. Okay. It could be as much as 12 cents, went into redevelopment. And uh, the city's got the money, the counties did not. Um, and it was supposed to be for blighted areas. And some cities were out of control. That's why redevelopment ended. Um, mm -hmm. San Jose was one of those cities out of control with using non-blighted areas and using money. Um, once those dollars were ended by the court, and this was our county council, James Williams, at 27 years old, was the lead litigator in the California Supreme Court mm -hmm. for this case. Uh, and, and of course it was one uh, and all redevelopment agents were disbanded. But once, so Santa Clara Unified, for example, mm -hmm. was one of those districts that got a major, they've gotten, and Milpitas Unified, mm -hmm. major infusion of dollars from the former redevelopment dollars that went to the cities for blighted areas now we're going to the schools and it's millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe, uh, maybe 60 to a hundred million in, in, in Santa Clara, they were the biggest one that, uh, that received it and, and probably half of that in Milpitas Unified. And the reason why Santa's a Unified has not become basic aid and another one being um, a small 901 district whose name escapes me by the county office, mm -hmm. um, Oh gosh, um, it's it's kind of contiguous with San Jose Unified that district. Somebody must know it, and they could tell me. But um, it's not the East Side Union High School District; it's further. 
No, it's a, it's a small elementary district, a K district, that is fewer than 800, 900 students. Okay. But um, the reason why they haven't received the, the, the dollars mm -hmm. is because San Jose is in such a hole. And they were over a billion dollar hole at one time mm -hmm. that they had to pay back. And I don't know what it is today, but it was uh, projected by James Williams when he was attending our closed sessions that it would be probably another the last time he spoke to us about that was probably three years ago. It's probably going to be another five years. So we may only be two years away. From, but now the city budgets have been impacted with, with COVID-19 related issues. So mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know how that plays out. But sometime in the future, San Jose Unified will get those dollars and they will become a basic aid district. That will be the tipping point for them being basic aid and no longer revenue limit or apportionment paid per ADA. Well, and this is the year that it would be needed, right? Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Yeah. I, I'm letting a lot of questions go here. Let me try to tackle a few of these. Sure. Um, so, uh, Lisa. Can I take a pause one second? Yes. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. And I appreciate there are a lot of great questions coming up here. I'm going to try to get through all of them. So sure. thank you. Please do. Um, Hopefully I can answer most of them. Yeah, <laughs> I, I feel you. Um, so uh, Deborah asks, how do you think Gavin Newsom is handling helping school districts getting the funding they need to support their students during COVID? And do you think he understands how much is in the school on the school district's plates in his reactions? I, I do. I think I think he does understand, and I do think the cuts that have been addressed in the ad that CTA is running uh, mm -hmm. about ten billion dollars cut, cuts. You know that, that is not going to happen in that in in that manner. <clears throat> and I think he, I think he, I think it's in, it's we're at a really critical time, mm -hmm. um, obviously. Um, and I think he's a leader that, that gets schools. He gets early learning. One of the things that I think is going to be impacted is his promises about early learning, mm -hmm. um, because I think that uh, making sure that all three and four-year-olds have, particularly for those who don't have the ability to, to go to um, transitional kindergarten, since they're not one of those 25% that would make the cut, yeah. Um, or they don't have the resources as families to make sure they go to a preschool, a high quality preschool. And that there's some research that says a two year, there's a lot of research that says a two year dosage of high quality early learning will ensure that we end the dropout issues in high school. We still have, in Santa Clara County, we still have approximately 30%, 29% of our Latinx students do not graduate high school. And if you don't graduate high school, it's said to be economic suicide. Mm -hmm. um, and to, for this, for Silicon Valley to have that delta, that right. issue with the wealth that we have is, is an anathema to me. Um, so, it, but early learning takes care of that, they say. Um, and I believe it to be true. Two-year dosage of early learning, mm -hmm. high, high quality early learning. And Gavin was committed to that, <clears throat> to get to that point, excuse me. <clears throat> However, now that's going to be delayed. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to focus on transitional kindergarten through grade 12. Um, I, I, I think there's some thinking about grade 12. There should be. There has been thinking in the past about grade 12. Do we really need grade 12? Since a lot of seniors have done, by the second semester, have done most of what they've needed to do. Um, so can high school be reconfigured? I think those are the kinds of bold things in the future that we have to think about so that we give more money to early, to early learning. Um, I don't know what you do. Um, anyway, that's, that's another point, but something that has been discussed many times. Why don't you ask another question and get off that soapbox? Sure, sure. Um. <clears throat> So an, another uh, question from Lisa is, is how, where will San Jose Unified get the money to pay for this? They don't even have the devices to hand out to kids with need. How will they manage masks? I mean, every little detail that is additional, right? How are they going to be able to fund this? Correct. And the fact that if there's two or three children to a family, they all need devices. 
and we, we haven't even dealt with the access issue to the internet, mm -hmm. um, which is something we need. And something was part of the, the webinar at the county office. It was something that the mayor said, the mayor's working on this and has certain dollars that have, been, have come into this um, city digital collaborative, mm -hmm. but it's nowhere near where it needs to be. It seems like we need some angels to step up and in, in the high tech world to make sure and address because it's too, it's, it's, you can't get a, a, a referendum on the ballot soon enough to make that happen. Um, so it's gonna have to be, I, and it can't be, you know, as, as my, one of my neighbors recently said, well, we could get all kinds of people to donate their use. We, I can get my company to donate four year old computers. Mm -hmm. That is not necessarily the way for us to go with this because of the technology changing so fast and those who are going to be compromised by having older hardware. But perhaps that's a step. And I, I think it needs to be organized. I think the county office is, is a legitimate body to organize some of this. And I think that hopefully the, uh, the uh, survey that was uh, recently, uh, the end of May, sent, sent out, or at least listed online, um, will lead us to, and I think the webinar will lead us to some solution sets. We have a meeting next Wednesday, so I hope we discuss some of these things. I, I won't see the agenda until Friday of this week, but I hope that some of these things are on our agenda. And our agenda, our meetings are live streamed for anybody to watch. They begin at five o'clock. Oftentimes we go into closed session shortly thereafter and then pick it up again at seven. But you could, they're all archived. You could see all our meetings and go back years, probably four or five years. But isn't, isn't the meeting this Wednesday? It's not this Wednesday. It's next Wednesday. We uh, only meet once in June. Oh, I could have sworn I saw a different date. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. So here's a question from... Um, sorry. A lot of comments in the midst of this too. Let's see. <laughs> well, there is some concern about younger kids not getting that recess time. Um, you know, if if schools were to open, that they'd be limited in recess time, access to play structures. There's push for more outdoor time than indoor time, um, just for health reasons, right? And right. and we have so many campuses where the fields were have been eaten up a bit by portables so you know, i'm not sure what a good answer would be on that um you know what do you th do you think it would be smart for schools to maybe look outside of the framework of their location and consider neighboring parks as an alternative space to go to i think that i have thought about this kristen and i've thought about what restaurants are doing now right they're they're mm -hmm. expanding their outdoor areas yeah. since the in, indoors is not something that can be can be used so the expansion mm -hmm. of the outdoor area for schools or outdoor classrooms or outdoor education if you will is certainly appropriate for schools to 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 look at um you've got to mitigate for noise and surrounding noise uh, since I know I, I, I was born kind of with an auditory discrimination problem, and if there's competing mm -hmm. noises, I have a really difficult time focusing on, on what I should be focusing on. Um, so I know that other children have same, same types of issues. So I think you have to mitigate for that. But I do think that schools should think about expanding their places to do learning, uh, in-person learning, to the out, outdoors. Uh, when they can. I think that's a, that's a good thing. I think you could learn a lot. Um, you can, and you could be, you, you could, I bet it takes, it takes creative, um, inspiring work to use the kinds of things that you see in certain schools with gardens and things and, um, mm -hmm and not just gardens, but there could be so many things that could be done using the construction technology, for example, 
using and using math in a way that that could be done through construction. There are a lot of things with project-based learning that could be done through an extended classroom environment outside. I think that, but that's that's probably for another day. That's there's too many things to focus on just to make this all work for the number of people that will be coming back to that uh, school institution, that school building. So Tina asks, if a parent chooses to do homeschooling or distance learning and wants to wait out the number of cases and possibly wait for the vaccine, um, can they do that and get support without losing their spot at their home school and still be able to return to the home school? That's going to have to be worked out on the local level. That's something that would come for policy decision with, I think, the trustees and the superintendent discussing. So I think that's all possible, but it would have to be part of a larger conversation with the governance team. Um, yeah. Because I, I know that you, you're in certain schools that you want to, parents want to stay in if, they, uh, if it's a neighborhood school or it's a school that they believe has a certain... Um, emphasis that they, they prefer, a magnet school that they prefer, like uh, Castellero. Uh, I think that's an important consideration. It's a good question, and I think it has to be addressed at the local level with the governance team. Okay. Tina asks, if, if we distance learn, will they give the teachers training? Uh, she follows that with, I think that's what we need to be prepared for any future. I'm going to add to that, that we've I've been asking the uh, inclusion collaborative team to consider as a uh, professional development, teaching teachers how to teach parents to teach. <laughs> if we're continuing the remote learning. So, um, but, uh, so her question is, is distance learning, will they give the teachers the training so they, they're better equipped next round? I think that that's, a, again, I think that that has to be a huge piece mm -hmm. of the next couple of months. Uh, and I think that you have to you, you have to find the dollars to pay the staff to come back to get this training, uh, or it could be done remotely. Perhaps my wife is involved. Um, she's getting a thousand dollars from San Jose State University for being part of a, uh, a, a distance a Zoom, a Zoom technology class. And today was her first class, and it was two hours from ten to twelve. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the the class is all done remotely at her own time. Um, it's all going to be uh, uh, taped uh, uh, sessions that she could go to online anytime she wishes. Mm -hmm. And she has to finish it by June 28th. So it seems like districts, or in this case, San Jose Unified, could pick up the same kind of process and make sure, give a stipend, and make mm -hmm. sure that every teacher uh, is equipped with all of these skills that are learned best practices mm -hmm. relative to to, to teaching. And she also, my wife, there are four teachers, four faculty members of San Jose State in her department, which is journalism and mass communications, that have a mentor. So they've been assigned a mentor to work with in, that, in their department. And that mentor is uh, probably applied for that position to be a mentor and is going to get a stipend as well. So it's a win-win for mm -hmm. everybody. And I know that my wife and I did Zoom classes. I only had one class. She had three classes uh, oh. a week to do and, and or a day to do, and they were exhausting for her. Um, uh, more exhausting than being in, in, a, in an in-person class. Because she was learning so much, mm -hmm. um, it'll be easier next semester. I think it'll be easier for me next semester. But San Jose State, as you know, went to, decided to go to distance learning yeah. um, for all, or all of California State University schools. They will have no in-person, except for certain classes that need in-person in the, in the fall. Okay. Are you ready for that? Am I ready for... Are you teaching next semester? I am. I am. And I'm ready. Yes, I'm ready because my class is Justice Studies 132, Race, Gender, Inequality, and Law. And what a perfect time, moment in yes. time to mm -hmm. be talking to 20-something-year-olds about these issues mm. of race in America. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, let's see, Tina was asking about the, if, if we're expecting a surge in cases coming this fall, you, she, 
she's just asking, what about it? Um, you know, what about the drone surge in cases that we know is coming? So if, if we were seeing the writing on the wall that we might have another uptick, how is that going to change the course of things, I think is her intention. Well, I think that the districts have to, in their planning, mm -hmm. have to have, if X happens, then we go to Y plan. Um, if W happens, we go to Z plan. Um, yeah. So I think they have to have that in their, in their, in, in their uh, tool, toolkit uh, as they plan for 2020, 21. Um, and, and I know that it's, it's not easy to get the governance team to have all these discussions, but it's imperative, I think, that that, that happens um, frequently going forward because I think there's a lot of things that we don't know and there could be a spike and, and then schools could close again immediately, uh, mm -hmm. right? Which puts everybody, and parents are back at work um, and, and are, the, are schools gonna be able to close because they have an individual spike? Is one school gonna be, in close, be able to close and not others? Right. I, I don't know. Um, but those because are all local decisions, right? They're all local decisions. And, they, and those need to be thought through. Maybe they have been, but they need to be thought through now as we approach um, the middle of June uh, because the time, goes, the time is, goes by so fast. Yes, I agree. And I, I think there's going to be a significant amount of recalibration this next semester. Um, so one teacher has observed that, that at, her, at a department meeting at her school, two out of 13 department members felt comfortable returning, which is not a good ratio there. How do you feel about, you know, the, the sense of safety returning that our teachers might have? I think it's huge. As a former teacher association president, working conditions mm -hmm. are a vital part of a collective bargaining agreement. Um, so I, I, I do think there's a lot of work that has to be done um, to make sure that not just teachers, but the uh, classified staff as well, uh, feel um, that their, their health is being um, considered. Mm -hmm. um, as sacrosanct, um, because soon as they were few believe that their health is not being considered, um, then that will that will maybe trigger more to feel as though they shouldn't be there, and that's there are many issues like that going forward that I think have to be discussed, and and it's with it's union leadership is is imperative at this to discuss it with it and plan, plan for this. But I think, uh, I think there'll be many, many, um, meaning that there are, let's just give a number of a thousand teachers in San Jose Unified. I would think that would be 20% of them. In your case scenario, there's, that's more than, you said more than 20%. You said yeah. how many out, out of? Two out of 13. So yeah. we're not even a fifth, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, I think I think those those are issues that have to be discussed and planned accordingly right now for if those things happen what what to do. Yeah. I mm. Yes. Um so I think we were talking about the development issue. Someone wanted to know um when is the redevelopment money finished being paid off? Do you have a sense of that for San Jose? I, I did have a sense that it would probably be in the middle of the 20s, like 2025 uh, or 2023 to 2025, but I'm not so sure with how the city budget, I don't know where that billion dollar hole is at the present time. They did sell some property um, mm -hmm. that helped with that. So I don't, I don't know, but it should be, you know who would know the answer to that? Because Susan Ellenberg, I brought her to a meeting with James, James Williams Mm -hmm. uh, when she was still a trustee mm -hmm. and she I think has still been now she works with James on, on a pretty much on a daily basis so okay. she probably has she probably has that information or can find out that information okay quickly. I'll ask one of her office assistants to, to ask for me great thank you you're welcome um oh then a few people are suggesting the district you were referring to what is it the union school district or Luther, Luther Burbank no, uh, no. Luther Burbank is is a is a 901 uh, direct service district for county offices. 
because it's smaller than 900 students. No, it, that was not the district. It's a district by uh, San Jose Municipal Golf Course and by the county office, Old Old Oakland Road. It's off of Old Oakland Road, uh, but it, it, its name it's, it escapes me. Okay, I'll think of it in a moment. <laughs> or late tonight, it'll come to your mind. Um, Orchard. Orchard. Yeah, Orchard. <laughs> I knew it started with an O. Orchard. Thank you. Was that Tiffany? No. Oh, no. Whoever said it. Thank you. Janica. Yes. Oh, so Janica. It's Orchard. It's Jan. It's yes. Orchard School District. Okay. Yay. Thank you. All right. Um, Tina commented that the guidelines say K through third on site for reading instruction. How does that work at six feet apart? I yeah, know. not well. Yeah. Uh, not well. So, um, therefore, um, I think that we have to use technology um, and, mm. and headphones and maybe uh, mm. computers um, to, to do some of that in, in strategic ways and not, you're absolutely correct, it doesn't work six feet apart. There's a volunteer group that, that um, Bakrat uses called Reading Partners, and they come out and individually will work with some of the struggling readers. And I've been asking them, what's their plan? You know, what's your plan to work remotely? And, and they're, they're struggling with this too. So it, it's a lot to work through. Um, okay. So, um, Scout's commenting that, you know, we need to have kids on campus at least a few days a week for several reasons. One, equity just doesn't work with remote learning. These online setups are tricky and all families, uh, not all families have the network, which you've commented on too, or the network of friends with answers, or the Wi-Fi, or the space, or the money, and so on. Number two, people won't enroll in school at all if school doesn't take the kids out of the house. Three, working people need the support the kids and then finally the kids just need each other and i think that's very true too very true amen, amen to that yeah um so children may be less susceptible to covid but what if they have family members uh that they'll be compromised that the family members will be compromised so that was i think in when we were talking earlier about children having a lower um incidence of covid yeah, Dr. Sarah Cody referred to children as super spreaders in one of her elected official um, seminars. Hmm. Super spreaders. And you could understand how that'd be possible. They probably don't have any symptoms, but they have the virus and they are super spreaders. So, And, and when I heard that, and in that particular one was probably a month ago, Mm -hmm. I said, there's no, when I heard that, I said, there's no way school's going to open in the fall um, to myself. But I think we're moving beyond that and school will open in the fall in some way. Okay. Maybe in a hybrid way, I'm not sure. The hybrid way makes sense to me, although it doesn't make sense to those parents who are working and have to be away from the home. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't make any sense but to have, um, you know, a third of the students there on, on a Monday, Tuesday, a third of the students, and then those same students are distance learning from Wednesday, Wednesday to Thursday. It doesn't make, to keep class sizes small, mm -hmm. but it doesn't make sense to, if parents are back at work to have that. It, you can't have children, you know, particularly elementary children home alone doing distance learning. Yeah. It just doesn't work. It has to be a non-starter. Yeah. Scout commented the San Jose RDA debt is, is $1.8 billion and won't be paid off until 2036. There you go. Wow. Okay. Now we know. That's really sad. Uh, Tina. Uh, Susan got back to somebody? You got back to you or somebody that quickly? Is that Susan? Yeah. yeah. No. If it was Susan, she would know. Okay. I never know because sometimes people enter a different name than theirs, but it's Scouts is the name that I get to see. Tina commented that not all kids can do outdoors, neither um, plus kinders with the ability to get up and run around. <laughs> I 
because they, they have that energy. <laughs> yes, that's true. Tina, uh, Tiffany Maciel has a question. Last I heard, the educational platform used with children in juvenile detention was heavily dependent upon the ability to read. Is the Santa Clara County Office of Education addressing this with a more universally designed approach? And, and she noted that kids in juvenile detention are on average of seven academic years behind, which is just devastating. They are. I mean, with, to, to Tiffany's point, it mm -hmm. said if you, if you have a regular Santa Cruz Unified class of seventh graders, there's mm -hmm. a seven year disparity with those seventh graders in reading ability. Wow. Um, and so it's not just in, in incarcerated youth, but incarcerated youth, as I've said, as Tiffany may have heard me say, mm -hmm. um, when I first started as, as a teacher in Osborne School at Juvenile Hall, the, the head teacher came to me and said, by the way, Mr. DeSalvo, I was 23 years old, and he's barking at me that our children read way below grade level. So I want you to know that. So when the data came out, it was, it was three years below. The average incarcerated youth, at that, and that's when Juvenile Hall had over 300 students in it. Um, and the county office supplies all the educational programs to incarcerated youth for the county, for those that uh, may not have known. Um, and we, we had a report by Catherine Lucero, who's the presiding judge of the juvenile court a year ago. Mm -hmm. And she used the same data that students in, in, in juvenile hall read three or more years below grade level. And I'm saying to myself, that I, I, I heard that one in 1974 when I was in my early 20s. And here I am, 67, hearing the same thing. What's wrong with that picture, I tell myself? Because yeah. if we know that a lot of their, their issues about crime and behavior related to them not being able to learn. In fact, when I taught at Juvenile Hall, my students, half of my students could not read a restaurant menu and they were 15, 16, 17 years old. They could not read a restaurant menu. Um, and, and, and that's tragic and it points the finger at you know, the number one civil rights issue of our time is, is the quality of public education. We need to do better. And the silver bullet, as I've learned through my work at the county office, is really high quality early learning for all. And Gavin mm -hmm. was going to make that a priority. Governor Brown did not. He didn't think it was important. Um, didn't believe in it, uh, even though I went to Sacramento for four consecutive years and sat in his conference room and meeting with other legislators saying that, you know, early learning, because it was our early learning group, including mm -hmm. the chamber, including SVO came, the leadership of the chamber came every year with us because they saw it as a, as a workforce issue. Yes, um, yeah. And, and, you know, instead of reaching in our pockets to pay for early learning, we paid for roads and transportation uh, mm -hmm. in bonds, but not for early learning. Some um, jurisdictions have, have passed a soda tax mm -hmm. uh, to pay for early learning. Um, we needed about $80 million annually more to cover everybody, the 8,000 children that do not have early learning in Santa Clara County, most of those living in San Jose. Mm -hmm. um, it could have been anywhere between 35 million and 80 million, but th these were like napkin figure we, on the back of a napkin we were figuring. Um, but now there is a moratorium on any soda taxes for 10 years in the state of California because a lot, the lobby, soda lobby made sure that the legislator voted not to do that anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So there's no more soda taxes that are uh, eligible. I don't know if I answered your question, Tiffany. Uh, I probably got away and didn't answer your question, but if you want to ask it again, I'll. I, I think you, I think you did. Because okay. she, she just had talked about the educational platform used with children in juvenile detention was heavily dependent upon the ability to read, which you'd commented on, you know, the struggle with, with the disparity of what the, the literacy Okay. Is, is the lack of literacy um, an unidentified learning disability for them, or do you think it's other factors? I think all factors. Okay. Um, they didn't have a parent that, that knew that it was important to, to read to them when they were young. Um, and in fact, when I went to a chapter one workshop when I was a principal, um, they would, this I think was in the South somewhere, state in, in the South, I think it was maybe Georgia, and they brought groups of parents 
to a central location, picked them up at night in a, in a district bus, and showed them how to read to their children without, because there are 20 million Americans that are, that are illiterate or low literate in America. And mm -hmm. you keep sending out these newsletters as principals that say, read to your children, and they don't read. So they, but they could talk to them. They could have, they could sit down with a picture book and do the picture book. Or they could sit down mm -hmm. with a family album and talk about the family album and people, mm -hmm. all those words. The fact that you know, you've heard this, you probably all know the studies about words. Um, those who have a more um, uh, educated parent and affluent background have oodles more words spoken in the home than those that don't. And mm. so those um, issues of, that come up with incarcerated youth are certain have to partly to do with that, it has to do with uh, attendance in the elementary age uh, years when they may not be attending on a regular basis as much as they, they have before, um, and, or as much as they should attend school. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to go to my door. If you could have a conversation round table amongst you until I come back from my door. <laughs> All right, that's fine. Appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, Tracy, I'm wondering if you could unmute yourself and talk a little bit. You commented that there's a well-rounded team at San Jose Unified School District on the reopening task force. Could you talk a little bit about that team makeup? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I'm running upstairs. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it is on our uh, yeah, let's see. From the district's end, it is made up of uh, a number of um, Nancy Albron, obviously, and a number of her direct reports. There are um, principals from high school, middle school, elementary. There's teacher representation. There's um, medical, well, health services representation. Then? And then there's representation from uh, the various unions within the district. Okay. Do you think they're going to, from what you see of the team, do you think they'll be covering English language learners well and special education adequately? I'm sure they will. It's a, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, I, I watched and, and read with, with interest. Um, it's a very um, smart mm -hmm. uh, group of people. And it's a group of people who has a very good understanding of the, the breadth of, of needs across the district. Great. So I, I looked at it and I'm like, excellent. You mm -hmm. can't invite everybody to the table and have a productive discussion and move forward. Time is limited, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, but when I look at this, I say, yeah, uh, great. Couldn't be more pleased. And so then some of the concerns you're hearing raised tonight are concern concerns that they've been in consideration of? We're not privy to the discussion, um, okay. but but I have no doubt that given the the breadth of perspective that's on the board, that mm -hmm. they will be covering all issues. Okay. And and you know some of the some of the questions that are in here mm -hmm. are questions that you know internally have already been answered. I know there's frustration with people about not getting answers back and things. And, and by the way, I'm speaking strictly for myself as an individual, I'm certainly not speaking for the district. Mm -hmm. um, but what you have to keep in mind is there are, what do we have, 30,000 students in the yeah. district and a number of engaged parents. There are lots of mouths mm -hmm. talking. Mm -hmm. There are still 24 hours in the day for those people. So just because you didn't hear back doesn't mean you weren't heard. And I think that's a really bad assumption to make that just because somebody didn't get back to you and say, well, what, what about this? What about this? Mm -hmm. um, is, is to say, well, then, you know, no one's paying attention to me. I, I just simply don't think that's true. Okay. Thank you. I think that sometimes it needs to just be heard. And I, um, you know, I feel that I run into that, that a lot where I, I don't hear a response, but sometimes if I follow up, I get the story of how busy they've been and just didn't have the bandwidth to do that response. So I appreciate that comment. 
Um, so I also want to thank Tammy Sell, who know, who said, I'm Scout, that's who I am. Um, but her information about the RDA debt came from Steve McMahon, which I'm sure that was brought up in a board meeting more than once. Okay, good. good. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. <clears throat> I'm, I'm almost getting caught up with all the comments and questions here. Um, Kristen, if you wanted me to address, if you have more questions, I'd be glad to, but if you wanted me to address the issue that the bottom of your, um, which you didn't know if I wanted to get into that, but I, I well, do yeah, what, like to get into that. I would like to know what you what you see in the planning for reopening schools in the county to prepare for the next wave of, of closures. Well, I was thinking about the one about school districts. Um, yeah. Okay. But, but. Um, Go ahead. So, so repeat, repeat your question because I was thinking on another track. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Go ahead with that track and I'll follow up with this one. How's that? Okay. Well, you, you raised the issue and I'm trying to find your, what you said in your document here. That it was okay. Kind of. Um, Are some districts too big? Parent, you said parent threads yeah. are calling for division of Santa's Unified School District because Alberon often noted they were too big to make some pivots. Don't I don't I, don't know if you want to touch that at this time. When I pose the question in a forum, are some districts too big? The response was it isn't the size, is the ability of the administration to adapt. Yeah. And I wanted to address that if I if I might. That would be uh, lovely. Thank you. I um Yes, I think that it, it's, it, I think we have, we have 31 districts in Santa Clara County. We have 19 school districts in San Jose. So you, one has to ask the question, uh, why is one 32,000 and one 900, uh, like in the case of Orchard? Mm -hmm. And there's no easy answers. Um, but I know when I wrote, I wrote a weekly column for San Jose Inside on education for five years, 300 columns approximately. And I wrote about this several times. And I was thinking that I don't think it's relative to size, because I do think that if the civil grand jury, two years in succession, mm -hmm. addressed the issue about consolidation of school districts, um, there are two issues. There's the consolidation of school districts, because there's 31. And in fact, um, there was a report done, um, are 31 dis school districts too many for Santa Clara County? And it was news. done back in 2012 yeah. by the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Um, mm -hmm. And the answer was yes, there are too many. Civil Grand Jury did two years in a row that uh, ways that they would reconfigure school districts in Santa Clara County. Those reports are part of the public record. <laughs> Leon Beachman and I, who was one of my trustees' colleagues on the county board, mm -hmm. wanted to go to Luther Burbank and explain to them, since they're a small district, you could throw a rock and, and from Luther Burbank, you could be a seventh grader, and throw a rock from Luther Burbank and uh -huh. hit the, uh, the field at Lincoln High School. Okay. And those eighth graders from Luther Burbank went to Del Mar High School, which was not close to Lincoln High School. Okay. And San Jose Unified really wanted to unify those districts together, or mm -hmm. Luther Burbank and San Jose Unified. Vincent Matthews, when he was there, wanted to do that. And we, so we thought, let's go, to, let's go to Luther Burbank and talk to parents about how they could do that, because we're the office that handles that. Mm -hmm. We have a, a committee on school district organization <clears throat> with a person from every school district that works with uh, our staff, who and then it has to go to some department in the state to make it happen and then to call for an election. So we knew how to do it. We wanted to just give them the information if they were interested. They mm -hmm. never were interested in, in doing so. They wanted to keep their small district together as most districts probably would, but they were in a hole financially. So I think there are some districts that are too large, um, but I wrote a column that said that if we divided 160,000 students or what was 100, 160,000 students up in San Jose, there's approximately mm -hmm. 275,000 in the county. 
and is approximately 160,000 in San Jose, if my numbers serve me correctly at this moment. <coughs> and if you, if you had four school districts of 40,000 students um, we, that were transitional kindergarten to grade 12, <coughs> I wrote that I thought that would be infinitely better than this checkered system we have with K-8s, 9-12s, um, non-unified school districts, because unified school districts actually from the state get more money than K-8 districts, because mm. uh, TK through grade eight, um, because they, it costs more to run high schools than it does uh, school districts, other school, uh, K-8 districts. Mm -hmm. So I think there's no right size. I think it can be a 40, I, I, I think we'd be much better served. The civil grand jury said, there's so much redundancy in, in the fact we have 31 school districts in Santa Clara County. They tagged it at $22 million of public dollars wasted when you have, when districts have to have a 900 school district has to have their own superintendent, their own director of special ed, et cetera, et cetera, and their own uh, HR, assistant super of HR, et cetera. You have some districts that are 3,000 student districts in Santa Clara County and some that are 10,000 and some that are 8,000. They're all different sizes, but they all have the same number of, of heavy weighted salaried staff members. And so I think the 22 million figure is probably, I didn't study it, but they did, and that's in one of their reports. So mm -hmm. I think that's relevant for us going mm -hmm. forward. The Silicon Valley Community Foundation said 31 districts were too many. Um, and there were 27, I think, in San Mateo County, because they did it as two counties. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that, but it's almost impossible to get a dialogue about that um, started in, in any way, shape, or form. It's a shame because when I, I look at the, the projections of how funding will be in the next three or four years, I get concerned about some of the cuts that will hurt our students more. And it sounds to me, from what you've said, that a consolidation would be a way to bring back some of that funding into the system that we would be able to then pay our teachers and have a, that better education for our students. Right, and the civil grand jury, we, our volunteers mm -hmm. that are appointed, mm -hmm. um, come up with any issue that they think is relevant for the, for, to better serve the public. And two years in a row, they tackled this issue. And two mm -hmm. years in a row, the information came up to our board. Um, and two years in a row, we talked about it. And, mm -hmm. you know, Luther Burbank was our test case. And those parents wanted not, in fact, they brought about 150 parents to a board meeting with student signs and everything after, when I was board chair, after I raised the issue. And all we wanted to do is give them the information on how mm -hmm. they go about doing it, if they're interested. And mm -hmm. that raised, we want to keep our district, don't, don't take our, you know, don't take our district away. So it's really tough to do in reality. But I, I, maybe this is a unique time and a new time where it can be done. It makes yeah. sense to me. Well, you know, and, and you talk, touched upon another point I wanted to get to is it's a unique time where things are in shift. And I know that you are a huge advocate for inclusion. I advocate for inclusion too. Do you see the potential in the shift for some really good things to happen? And what are some of those really good things you'd like to see happen? Well, I'd like to see a school like uh, Eureka uh, uh -huh. happen. Um, and get, be an example of why inclusion uh, works with best, practice, best practices. I would rather see if we don't have a school like Eureka, that we have schools that have that as their, their uh, mantra, that we don't have any, we, we bring in the experts to the regular classroom and mm -hmm. all the children are included in the regular classroom. They're not excluded for, any reason unless it's before or after school but never during school they're mm. part of their class um, mm. and i think that could be done i think there that um at least through mild to moderate issues we were successful in doing that in milpitas unified when milpitas unified when i was a principal at russell middle school mm -hmm. we had um, a resource teacher assigned to teams our students were in teams interdisciplinary planning teams of about 160 students per team. And there may have been um, maybe 30 resource students. 
spread out in this. We grouped them in certain classrooms. So the resource specialists would be assigned to that team would go into those, those classes. And they were never excluded unless they were excluded before school or after school for pre-teaching or help with uh, their assignments. So I, I think it can be done. It has to be, it should be done. It should be the way of the world. Um, and regular education teachers need to have that on their tool belt, how to work effectively with a resource teacher in the, in the regular classroom for the benefit of the, all students, not just resource students, but other students that need assistance with their, their work. Or maybe, you know, all students learn just not in the same way on the same day. Um, and so, so I'd love to see Eureka. We did vote yeah. to approve Eureka, um, the county board, and it was gonna happen on appeal from San Jose Unified. And then for some reason that I'm not going to divulge, Mm -hmm. um, here, it was, uh, it was rescinded. Our approval was rescinded. <coughs> and it was crazy. It's still crazy in my mind that that happened. And uh, I would like, still like to see it go forward and see us have a beacon for the, for the inclusion work in Santa Clara County. Well, you, you'd also touched upon early on that the, the, the uh, County Board of Education gets gets to approve charter schools that the districts might have turned away. Yeah. And there's, there's growing restrictions in that process, yeah. um, which concerns me when you have said something as wonderful as Eureka on the table, it's like, you know, where, where are we making things? I mean, the, the, the thought process behind charter schools is here's an opportunity to have an option working that uh, takes takes care of some of the students that are not that are um, not getting what they need from their their districts right so let's build a school that focuses on that and maybe out of this process we'll learn something that the public schools can learn from too right which is what was so beautiful about Eureka yeah. and um, my concern is is that they're building momentum towards something that will shut down this opportunity and then we're stuck with just the public schools that might get wound up again in their own system and not looking for better ways. I don't know if you have any feelings on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> but that, that's my concern is that we're, we're taking away something that I'm going to be sorry to see go away entirely. You know, I understand. And I, and I, I agree with everything that you just said. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Do we? Does um? I th I think I got through all the questions in the chat. There's a lot a lot in chat though. So if I missed your question, could you unmute yourself and ask? Did yes. Hi, Mr. Savlo. I really appreciate you coming here and supporting us. That are really trying to support the district through all this mess. You know, it's really one thing to go through all the COVID and, you know, all the protests that's going on. I mean, just so much throwing at uh, the families and public at one time. I mean, just amazing that, you know, we don't have more mentality issues right now. You know, it's just, I just, I, I'm fear all that stuff. But, you know, I'm a mom of two special needs kids, and my son is going to be 19 this year, and he goes to the ACE program, the adult program right now. Yes. And he really needs to be more on the community uh, work experience uh, out and about that rather than being behind a computer. I mean, it is okay, but his mind is more to be outside. And so what I'm looking for is somehow the district can provide sort of a, a catch up, you know, later on when we get back on track, hopefully, uh, some kind of a push or some kind of a tutorial to help these special needs kids that are not really striving with the computers, you know, to do something more, like more, I don't know. I mean, I'm not quite sure what it is that, 
you know, my son would need to get pushed through this cycle because right now I feel like he's regressing a little bit. Uh, you know, it's hard to pull him away from the bed. It's hard for him to, to take a break, you know. You know, what kid doesn't want to be behind a computer? You know, that's just, it's hard enough to pull him away from it. But we're supposed to be sitting him down on a chair and making him focus on the computer. That's another challenge, you know. Yeah, I understand. What, what do you think is the issue? I mean. Well, are you speaking of a program within the County Office of Education that we have uh, yeah. for adults up to 22 years old? Yeah, he doesn't quite fit the County Office of Education. I mean, we kind of looked at that, but he really was doing well when he was able to work part time, you know, and being out and about, not so much behind, uh, at a desk. The range, uh, the range yeah. of instructional programs for what yeah. we, uh, we we need to have a rethinking and a reimagination of in in the county office. And so I don't know if you could be part of that if we do, but I think that we we do. The district said I think been asking us to do it for a long time, and I think we it's imperative that we at some point do that. But what I wanted to mention in addition to your question is I think that. I, I've always said, I've said this to Steve McMahon and, and Superintendent Alderon that I think they should stream their meetings. And Kristen, I don't know if you have anything to do. I think you do because I'm the one that got us the stream meeting when I was board chair. Yeah. Uh, but you don't have to be chair. You just need three people to say, let's do it. It's not a, a big cost. Yeah. Um, and I think it, in order for you to have access to the board and to the superintendent on a regular basis every other week, on a Thursday, you, you should have your meetings um, streamed um, and then archived. Yeah. Um, I think that makes it much more participatory. Um, and I think all of these issues could be brought up and addressed, um, or if, if not addressed, certainly, um, then you can come when we do have these in person again, um, you, you can come in person with, as, as Santa's Unified did with me, uh, att kind of attacking me for what I said about distance learning in San Jose Unified with 31 people saying that I was wrong and that San Jose Unified did a great job with their establishment of distance learning right at the beginning, although they did have to focus on food, et cetera, at the beginning. So mm -hmm. you could, and it certainly made an impact on me to listen to all those. Mm -hmm. and you, you could come in in mass to be at board meetings and, and to address certain concerns where the elected people like Kristen will have to respond um, rather than a one-off parent issue. Um, right. wor working and organizing together is ways to get certain things done in a very complicated system of public education. Um, the Holly posted, we, we expect kids to learn new things, but the teachers can't learn new things. I'm not Sure, I, I feel like the teachers are learning new systems. Holly, can you unmute yourself and maybe expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I, I, I'm hearing that older teachers don't wanna learn or I've heard directly that I don't, I don't wanna learn how to do a Zoom call or how to do anything. And I'm exceedingly frustrated that for the last two and a half months, my kids got nothing in high school. Um, and Again, I heard repeatedly, I, I don't want to do a Zoom call. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how. So right. my kids don't know how to do a lot of things and they're not learning anything. And the teacher's just going to be like, oh, okay. I just, I would really like the district to <laughs> mandate. These kids need something. And my kids got very, very little. And I still pay my taxes. So I'm exceedingly frustrated. And I know it's not every teacher. I get that. I just know that it's a lot of teachers in my world. So to say that I don't want to learn how to do a Zoom call is not acceptable to me. And those teachers are still there. Mm -hmm. I don't get how that works. So, Well, I, I think going forward, you know, locally, they'll have the opportunity for that professional development time to, to learn. And they'll there'll be more rigidity from the district moving forward on um, the expectation for faculty. It's just that they couldn't, in the moment, I don't think in the pivot, there was room for them to force anything. And I think the San Jose Teachers Association um, 
you know, I, I don't think that they had the room for the flexibility that to have how they were to instruct change overnight. Um, and I feel your frustration because I had a middle, I have a middle schooler and a high schooler and the level of teaching from their teachers was very, was quite a wide spectrum. And it was just, you know, their ability or their technology at home, if they thought to take their curriculum when they left the classroom, cause they couldn't get back. There was a lot of factors. So I, I do not think you're alone in your frustration. And I think, you know, some of the aspects of what you've gone through and what you're kids have gone through with the lack of learning have to be heard because if we're not looking at what didn't work how will we figure out what will work so i appreciate that comment yes Christina, I'm hand up. one more question for me oh. oh hey joe it's janica i wanted to put a bug in your ear about something so i work in corporate philanthropy and um one of the challenges that a lot of us who are um we need coming 44, from corporate computers for next year yeah i know right <laughs> i can't solve the world's problem but my thought is um when you talk about the amount of districts that we have one reason why corporate philanthropy is able to engage at san francisco unified is because it's one school district oakland unified it's one school district and we have a really hard time trying to figure out where to go to be able to um really engage on a deeper level so it's just another reason for why district consolidation would be really smart i, agree. I mean a lot of people are saying a lot of Emma Carson said there are 156 elected school board members in Santa Clara County. Who do you hold responsible? Yeah. And yeah, it's very diffused. That's the way I think it's designed, but I totally agree with what you said. Um, so it's not the size um, at all. So I agree. Kristen, thank you. Thank you. This has been very insightful. I really appreciate your time this evening and I, and I look forward to things to come, Joseph. Well, I, I just really appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you. You got up to like 90 something people. So obviously people in the district were calling and said, the salvo's on, you better listen to them. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I hope I didn't say anything untoward or that the district didn't appreciate or the staff didn't appreciate. I wanted to be honest and sincere with you all. And um, I, I, I hope to work more closely with Santa's Unified if I do get reelected uh, than I've ever done in the, in the past. So thank you all very much. Can you take one last question or do you, is it a hard? Sure. There's one from a, a staff member. She's asking, what is the current state of staffing teachers and support staff in the county? Do you have a sense of that or? In the county office of education? Yeah. I do not have a sense of that. Because okay. no. I've been hearing some people going and I thought, oh no. Okay. All right. I don't have a sense of that. No, we, we, and maybe I will at the next meeting, but I don't at this time. All right. So, All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you. it. Bravo. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Jenna. Bye, Tiffany. <laughs> so I do have the Zoom uh, open until 8 o'clock. I'm afraid Mr. DeSalvo had to go at 7.30. Um, were there questions that, you know, I tried to get to everything, but if there's some questions you want me to follow up with them to get back to, I could do that too. Or if you want to just have a general discussion, we can move on to that. No? Kristen? Yes, it's Linda. Linda. Hi. Hi, it's Linda Garbarino. Yes. So I have my standing question, which is the tools question. So if you're going to put a list together, um, can yes. you add that? Yes, I will. Yes. Thank you. I, I remember we had that talk about Canvas and other tools to just yeah. help That'd the be teachers great. coordinate better, especially, if, you know, middle and high school where you have too many teachers yeah. Yeah. committing right. a lot of time or heavy projects yes. and not realizing it. Yes. Thank you, exactly. Linda. Okay, thank I'm you. I'm sorry I overlooked that one. Oh, no, no, it was towards the end, so, and no problem, don't worry about it. I, I'm not sure it. how well he could answer that, but it, it would yeah. have been interesting to hear what they're using in. Yeah, uh, well, that was more my question was like, um, what does he see? Because there's, you know, we, I, San Jose Unified has horrible tools, mm -hmm. and you've got some districts that have great tools, so... I just kind of wanted to see, hear from his point of view, you know, what is his take on that? We're talking about hardware, getting yeah. everybody hardware, 
but there's a software piece too that's missing. So. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Shelby, did you want to unmute? It looks like you have your hand up. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering, I haven't heard much about this about, and it may not be related to tonight's topic, um, but okay. a voucher system for, for schools and mm -hmm. how that could help with hybrid schooling and when, what our parents can teach um, on their own. It would, I think, help with scheduling possibly and what we want to send our children to school for. Um, and I'm coming from the perspective of, I, I don't know that I, I don't think public school really works for my child. And I wanna see some kind of change in his life as I've seen him evolve without being in public school. Right. So, um, yeah, and I just haven't heard anybody talk about that. Um, so I was wondering if there's feedback. I think voucher systems run into the same thing that charter schools are going against, that the, the general sense of the draw is then taking the, that funding then would be taken out of the public education funds. And so there's always pushback with that, right? Um, but you know, you've, you're, it's interesting. I hadn't thought of the voucher system with the change in how education is being accessed right now with the virtual component. That's interesting. Thank you, Shelby. Does anyone else have a comment on that one? Kristen, I have a question if uh, yeah. you can. This is Mike Flynn. Uh, yeah. So my question is with regards to teachers. So the teachers would work, I'm just going to say hypothetically, um, uh, Monday through Friday from eight to two, just as around around time, right? Recognize right. that that's a little different. Why, when there was the shelter in place, why was that not that same sort of time frame mandated? And why was it allowed to be reduced to two learning experiences a week, which is what I was told. And I don't know if that's accurate or not. That's just what I've been told. And so I'm looking for that confirmation or, or, you know, uh, no, no, Mike, you're wrong. <laughs> right. Well, I don't know that the teachers were told how, you know, um, they were not given a threshold of what they had to teach, right? They needed to be touching base with their students regularly. And I, I think twice a week was what was, they were asked to, try to contact students twice a week. There was, there was pushback initially when the schedule first went up, when they um, had pushed out uh, different, um, different um, apps and, and, you know, Khan Academy and, and different models that were online that you could ask access for your students and they'd set up a schedule tentatively of, of how this could look for your home, right? And um, families that have homeschooled right away got back and said, this isn't how school works at home if you're doing this. But I, what you're talking about is more of that teacher time instead of the remote learning. So I think they're just, it's, it's new to the curriculum and instruction team of, of how does this, how is this going to work? And I don't think that they could ask the teachers to work that much because there was not enough of an understanding of what teachers were facing at home. And too many teachers had to leave without their materials. So then how do they access everything online? So there's, there was a lot of, of scrambling to grasp materials off online to then teach with. So I think there's just a lot more going on behind the scenes than, than we were given access to. But I think moving forward, insisting that there's a certain amount of time that's being taught during the day if we're continuing with remote learning, it's, it's certainly a direction that they would be going into. But um, yeah, I think we would need more teachers to comment on that. I don't, are there any teachers left on the call? Hey, Kristen, this is Renata. I, I've been listening in. Um, I, I'm a teacher at Allen at Steinbeck. Okay. And, um, one of the things that, yeah, I am echoing like most of what Kristen said. I have zero materials at home with me. I actually like don't even have a table. 
to work from. Um, I just bought a desk <laughs> so that I could teach summer school. Um, but I mean, I live in a teeny tiny little apartment. Like we, we have a, a bar, like, like, you know, the kitchen island is, is where we eat, right? Um, and so yeah, no instructional materials. I don't don't really have a space to work. Um, I'm very lucky in this case <laughs> that I do not have any children of my own, but many of my team members um, went all of a sudden to not only teaching their classes, but also sitting with their, their children at home and um, trying to help them through the distance learning experience. Um, and it really was like, a very trying time for all of us. Um, definitely, I think like mental health was, especially in those first couple of weeks of closure. I know like I, I personally really suffered those first couple of weeks because I, I, I do have anxiety. And so working through that while also trying to teach students, it, it's a lot. Um, and so, it, it just, it looks so different than what we experience in our day-to-day -day classrooms. Like if we had the ability to um, work with our students in that way, like that would be really, really amazing. Um, and then just kind of like anecdotally, I started teaching summer school today or extended school year, and we're doing uh, synchronous learning experiences um, every day. And it is so challenging. Um, I think I maybe had five minutes in my online class where all of my students were actually able to be online at the same time and have their videos on and be working with the WebEx platform. Like the bandwidth issues are really, really um, a huge hindrance in being able to do the um, online learning experience. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to, to answer any other questions. Like, again, like, like other teachers said, I can only really speak from my own experiences, but, but that's what I got. So I, and, I, know and the, I, oh, I was going to say, I know the district had offered the, like space at the home office if you needed to come and use internet or have a table. Did, did that get offered to you in any way? Oh, my internet's fine. It's the internet of my students. Oh, but like if I needed, um, no, there was, there wasn't anything offered about going into the district office that I can think of. Huh. Okay. But okay. I think that probably went through principals. So principals probably, depending on which principal you had, might have gotten lost somewhere. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Mike, go ahead. You had a question? I, I, yeah, I was just going to say, it, it, you know, and I appreciate the, the effort that that you made teaching and I recognize how hard it is. I was a uh, English teacher at Leland High School before I changed careers into tutoring. And um, the the aspect though that I find, so I had to I had to pivot very quickly just, just like everyone else in order to stay in business, right? Uh, was that we had to team up and we had to have some people take on certain responsibilities. And, and so I suppose my frustration was why why were there, if, if someone such as yourself, I'm, I apologize, I believe it was Renata that you said, you know, it was harder for you to teach in your setting. And so I understand and respect that. So maybe there's another teacher who was more of the lead on an online teacher um, or classroom setting. And then maybe other teachers did other support type services. Um, there just seemed to be a tremendous number of not really too creative of ways just to make teams engage and, and people work together. And that's what I fear going forward here is that we don't, if there was not some uh, kind of roll up the sleeves and, and let's figure out a way to get this done in the last 12 weeks, mm -hmm. what's, what's it going to look like going forward here? So that's, those are my real concerns here. I, I just, I, there, I don't believe I'm that, amazing of a problem solver it just was oh okay here you I'll teach your class and and, and then you grade my papers right uh, you know or hey I've got little kids and so I'll watch in the morning 
uh, my kids and all, and then someone else can watch them in the afternoon. There just seemed to be a lot of options there that, that got lost. And, and so that's any voice that you have, Kristen would be, we, we need to, we need to be very creative in our thinking here because um, this is not going to look like normal school next year. And we can't use the same thinking that got us into this problem to get us out of it. Right. Quoting Einstein. No, I, I agree. And, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful in some of the training that will be happening. Um, I'm in, I'm waiting for Jody Lax to comment on what that will look like. Cause I think they're still pulling that together, but um, the collaboration among the grades was not just an issue that we were seeing in, in our district, as I was talking to teachers from other districts, sometimes they had teachers that weren't willing to collaborate, that they, they had teachers that just wanted to deal with their class and not have to share classes or let me teach this section and you can teach that section. And that the districts that, that did have more collaboration, I think Palo Alto had a lot of teachers that were collaborating where I'll take on social studies, you take on English and they were sharing and um, working with because remotely you can work with a lot more students sometimes and then break them up into the group. So with the overlap time, they would break them up into groups. Each teacher would take them into smaller groups and have them do stuff and check in with them. And I thought that was really powerful, but learning where those models were that were really effective and getting the word then to the right people. I'm hoping it's happening because they talk about the superintendents all meeting weekly. Um, but there must there must be three thousand teachers in San Jose Unified, and yes. and it's it's striking to me that I was the only one that had that idea. Mm -hmm. You know that that's the thing is it I Palo Alto had it that's great, but why I and I deal with principals and vice principals a lot. Why was that the the sort of thinking that like oh let's try something and it's okay if it fails. Right. The parents were very very comfortable with failure. It was the lack of effort that we were so frustrated with, yeah. and and I and I don't want to blame all teachers because that's unfair. It's unfortunately it's a, it was some teachers who really let us down. And my other question to you would be, if people say, "Well, I'm not willing," don't they realize there's something bigger at stake than their own than their own desire? Right? They've got anywhere from thirty to one hundred and fifty kids that they're educating. Right. And that should be the priority, not something else. Anyway, I don't want a soapbox. I, it's your meeting. I just was my, that was my concern, but thank you for addressing that. Well, and, I, and I don't think that there was an option to substitute, you know, if, if a teacher was in, unable because of whatever was happening in their life to, to do a class. Um, I don't think that there was an option for a substitute and I, it would have been nice to have had something in place, I think, to redirect students to if they were not getting what they needed from a teacher. And, uh, you know, they had online options. They had a, apparently a great online science class, but I'm not sure that all families were checking that out. And I'm not sure it was great across all the grades or the math. Uh, did you look at any of the math? You're English though, right? You teach English. I'm sorry. Well, but I, I own tutoring center, so I teach everything now. Okay. Um, but it, no, it was, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I was, I think, frustrated in terms of with the communication. And again, that was, you know, like you, uh, you had said, oh, uh, to, to Renata, oh, did that, was that offered? No, that well, was never offered. So there really just seemed to be so many failures that seemed to be so simple to fix um, that uh, it's, it's shocking. Um, Anyway, uh, Jody Lax just sent something 13 minutes ago, 18 minutes ago, that said that there'll be an announcement on June 11th. Okay. So you were talking about what Jody was uh, going to send out that that would be. Who is Jody Lax? So she's Jody Lax is the assist. Well, I don't know what her assistant superintendent had changed recently, but she's the um, she is in charge of curriculum and instruction. Okay. Can I can I chime in just a moment? Yes, this is Tiffany. Hi. So I wanted to comment, Linda. I agree with you about the software problem. Um, <laughs> Google Classroom, PDFs do not convert into Google Docs, and simple things like that. And Tiffany, can you move closer to your microphone? You're getting a little garbled. Can you, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? No. 
Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Never mind. No, no, no. It's better. It's better. Just be, be closer to your microphone. Okay. I this so I've never had a problem before, so I'm hoping this will work. But I, so I wanted to just chime in and say, yes, Linda, I completely agree. And I was wondering, where's the IT department? And maybe this will be something that they will become more in tune with and maybe not use Google Docs for elementary school and Google Classroom and WebEx. That was very challenging. And then, Mike, I wanted to comment about what you were talking about and um, just, again, promote what Kristen and I have been trying to promote for years and years and years, which is the inclusive educational delivery model, which is really premised on an interdisciplinary team teaching approach. So that right now, I think that there's a, um, a huge opportunity to have the gen ed teacher come up with curriculum and the speech and the OT and the RSP teachers go in, look at that and universally design it for the whole class. So you're not having to individualize for every child, but if you do use the universal design approach, um, you're halfway there and the teacher doesn't have to come up with all of these different ways. So we've, we've talked about that team teaching and where you could depend on different people's strengths, right? You might be great at writing curriculum. I might be great at the technology and you might be great at talking to parents. So when you have that interdisciplinary team teaching uh, approach, it's not one person who has to be great at everything. Mm -hmm. And um, again, we've, we've talked about this. It's, it's 30 years of research and it's ongoing and fluid and it's working in other places. It's amazing that it's not here, but I, I think that, yes, you're right on about, <laughs> about working with your team. I like and, to say and, teaching is a team sport. Yes, you're right. Uh, it, you know, I coach, I coach at Willow Glen High a couple different sports and and we all have different specialties and there's sometimes that we can collaborate with someone and they see something that that uh, I see something they didn't and, and vice versa um, and collaborative learning with children is also um, you know if you you teach a big group and then all of a sudden you break it down I have some I, I teach it for a lot of uh, schools that don't have uh, the same socioeconomics, right? So I go teach an SAT class to 100 kids at Avid, say, in Santa Clara. Um, and I teach to the 100, but then I break them down into smaller groups, 30 groups of three. So I can really do that. Again, it's, it's not magic. It's, it, this is stuff that's been around, like you said, for years. Mm -hmm. But why and how this is all so new to everyone is what scares me so much, Kristen, is that it, there does not seem to be someone willing to say, okay, uh, I have the helm, let's go, <laughs> right? And that's what you need. You need a very strong leader that's going to say, we're going to try this and it can't look like what it's done before. Anyway, thank yeah. you, Tiffany. That was, I, you know, you're right. Mike, I have a question for you with the, the sports getting threatened to be set aside in the fall. Do you think there are creative ways, if, if given the guidelines of what the limitations would be, to still keep some of the support, some of the sports running that the district should be considering? So it's very hard because I coach track in the spring and football in the fall. Oh. And, you know, my track season got cut short right after a very uh, quick time. Yeah. Uh, but track is a socially distanced sport because it's running lanes. Yeah. Um, and so that's easier to, to separate. Uh, some of the distance events are not. Football, I just don't see how in the world, water polo, um, any of those sports where there's a, a mosh pit that occurs, I just don't see how that's gonna, um, gonna work. My son's a swimmer and you know they've proven that bromine and chlorine kill the virus and that they're more than six feet away, yet they still have the closed pools, so. Um, the other thing too, just uh, Renata, the, the the school after two weeks, right? I think in the early days, they were thinking that the virus could live for two weeks. I don't understand why the district did not allow for people to go back to their classroom to get the materials, knowing how critical that was. And you could have arranged a time. They arranged time for kids to go get caps and gowns. They arranged time for people to get meals. Um, you know, Kristen, I've said this on the on the Facebook page. Uh, 
you know, if they can, if they can arrange for, for kids to get meals or for people to get meals, they can also arrange for people to pick up homework. Um, so it, it's odd. Yeah. Anyway. We, we even had students uh, letting some of their, the staff that was reaching out to them know, I don't even have paper and to, to do my schoolwork with, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I was asking if they needed to have, you know, packets of materials available with a free meal handout, and they just weren't sure how to do that. I thought it's just an ask, you know. Right. And, you know, how's I? Yeah, I'm I'm a little exasperated over that one because that just seemed simple to me. But yeah. And I know that the meals. I'm going to get them all in. Sorry, so someone just tell me to shut up if I'm. But I'm going to get all my asks in now. It is fantastic and heroic what the district did in partnering with the city to get all of those people fed, right? The, yeah. however many, it was a, it's, it's a huge number. And, and I'm very fortunate that I don't, yeah, I don't have that need. Uh, but I appreciate the fact that that is, but it, that was only a certain type of staff that was doing that, correct? Yeah, that was my understanding is they were just yeah. u- using their nutritional staff and then some of right. the some of this city support too so okay so that that's fantastic so the nutritional staff was able to support where was all the other staff why why did they say they had to focus they couldn't focus on an education because they're focusing on nutrition but that seemed to be a segmented uh division of labor and why why couldn't i have all these people who weren't doing anything i have all these people serving mm-hmm. terrific keep them going right but if I have all these other people, I, the district hid, in my opinion, behind the nutrition aspect, and I find that to be very frustrating. Well, are you are you how are you going to promote yourself? Are you going to talk about you know, every mole on your body? Or are you going to you know say look at the just the visage, right? I mean, let's think about the strategy. <laughs> much much to be proud of was the title of their letter. Yeah, and and I think that that really rubbed people a lot of. Uh, uh, very rubbed them the wrong way because if they said, listen, uh, we tried and, and we struggled and we had success and we had failure and here's what we've done. But to come off and say, you know, look at me was very, was very frustrating. Well, and, and part of that goes back to not having the, um, those conversations, right? If, if they had just been honest and connecting from the get go of we're, we're trying to figure things out instead of saying, here's something, here's something, here's something, you know, um, I think it would have been an easier pill for everyone to swallow if presented the right way. No doubt. And, and we have said to numerous teachers, thank you for trying just as long as you tried and they go, that wasn't a success. I don't care. Thank you for trying. I don't know what works either. Yeah. Um, but it was that real, it was the, you know, the bait and switch, I think, is, is really what frustrated so many of us. Right. And I, th- I think some teachers were getting comfortable with Zoom when the whole, when the, the security of it blew up and the district yeah. took that off of their plate. And they're like, wait a minute, I was, I was mastering that. I was just getting good at that one. Yeah. No, no, I get yeah, it. It's, and, then, it's... and then they're tossed WebEx, which is a different, you know, it's not similar enough to, to work with and expected right. to, you know, that was tough. Those and those are kind of, in my opinion, those are understandable issues. Yes. I'm very comfortable with, you know what? We didn't know Zoom was, was so vulnerable. Okay, we're going to go to WebEx. Yeah. And then after a couple months, okay, WebEx wasn't really the best. Okay, you know, what, what should we do? Or it is, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't use WebEx. But, um, it, but again, all of those things were understandable. Yeah. Uh, but, but the hiding behind or, or the, the lack of, I don't want to say hiding. I think that's unfair. The lack of is, and there's a lack of, we, we could, we could put a lot of things and a lot of bullet points. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I think that, you know, the, and the other, the other fallout of all this is just not having the, the expectation security. Right. I mean, for students, they don't know what to expect when the fall begins. Right. Um, right. High school students don't know what to expect if it will be something that will help them still getting to college, you know? So I, I liked some of your ideas going out of uh, let's then enroll them in the JCs and enroll them in other options. Yeah. Yeah, my son, depending upon what, what happens in the school, we plan on, and I've already got 
you know, I, I know the routine, but I, I got permission from, from the school mm-hmm. is that we will uh, take him out and homeschool him in mm-hmm. two or three classes. And then he, we still maintain his mm-hmm. position in the school so he can play sports. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's that partial, it's that partial process that allows us to get what he needs because he's got multiple AP classes or honors classes. And, and those are prerequisites for future study. So I can't allow that to, to get lost. So, so that was one of the asks that families had is, is can we let students have a choice in yeah. rather than credit, no credit. And then, you know, I, I was having a discussion with someone just yesterday on the phone about, you know, what about just saying, can you let the AP students choose? Because these are grades that are really going to help them with those applications to college and university, you know. And a reduction and a reduction in fee when you get to college if you have enough units. Right, right. Yeah. You know, so my son, my older son went into Purdue as a second semester sophomore. So I, wow. I mean, that's a huge, that's a huge savings. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, so there, there's a lot of different issues. So the, now, the thing is, at every different school, there's some very good AP teachers who, even during this last little bit, were doing flips to keep their kids engaged. Oh, so, good. <laughs> yeah, no, no, right. It, it's not, it was not all bad. That was the yeah. thing. It was, the, and that was maybe what was so frustrating. Yeah. I think if it was universally bad across the board, every district struggled. I, okay, we shrug our shoulders and we just go on. Yeah. But we could tell some teachers did it some districts did it and why ours couldn't yeah so but the to to your question that um that uc scout stay online learning uh, byu online is not a good one that's credit recovery cyber Mm -hmm. high those are credit recovery those are not ones that you want to put on a transcript right uc scout obviously because they're affiliated with the uc system and stanford online those are the two that would be your best bets to do a homeschool, if once you get into your your uh, class setting next year and you recognize, okay, there is no school, mm-hmm. and the person I have is not fulfilling what I need, right? Then you would pull out part time, uh-huh. and like you said, primarily for the AP or honors courses, yeah. And then mm-hmm. you would be homeschooled, but mm-hmm. by doing it through the district, the district still gets money, if I understand correctly. They're still getting paid. It yeah. still maintains your ability to have sports and activities. But most importantly, if we do have to redu- um, you know, shelter in place in the fall, right? right. There's some predictions right. that that's going to occur. Yeah. Um, kind of like the flu. Mm-hmm. And then we go back in second semester. My child has no issue integrating right back into second semester. Well, unless they're significantly behind where he is, right? Then you have a student who's bored. <laughs> Correct. However, if you do the UC Scout system, they do it by semester. Okay. okay. So you would purchase a semester at a time. And I wouldn't purchase the whole year course. I'd purchase a semester. Okay. And I would have my son get up to December. And then you would like to think that that would be somewhere within reason, but you bring a very good point. But the AP classes, they're very structured. Yes. There's, you know, you have to get to a certain point by May. And yeah. so from the most point, those are there should never be more than a few week gap there. Okay. And, and in doing that, um, do you think it's smart to just go ahead and pre enroll and then, then if, if the teacher looks good in the district, take them out or to just go ahead and get it set up and, and not, not play around with it. Come. So I'm one of keeping my options open. Uh, there, um, maybe, maybe we have a blistering hot summer and the virus dies <laughs> and um, everyone wears a mask yeah. and, you know, all of that. Uh, but the, the, the very nice thing about this is that the UC Scout, because it's an online aspect, that's just to put in a credit card for, you know, a semester and you can do that at any point. Um, I would, though, recommend to, to people go ahead and, and telegraph to the school what, might, what you might do. Okay. So I've already done that with my principal. I said, this is what we're anticipating. I'm hoping that it doesn't get to this point, but I, I just want to be at the forefront. If I need to, we, we don't have to go through a lengthy process. 
I, I was disappointed that Willow Glen High School had already talked about taking physics two off the map, which is a shame for those students working on that path. But, but now they're taking AP chemistry off, which some of those students were taking as a backup because they didn't get enough enrollment. So I feel like if they're going to take both of them off, they need to alternate years if they're going, you know, they talked about right. alternate years, but now it's like they're going to have them synced. <laughs> it does, I just, it's a cart and horse issue to me. It's like this, this isn't quite right. You don't line them up next to each other. Right, so uh, very good point. And, and there are, I've been generally happy with Willow Glen if you get into the right track, right? The honors and AP course, it's, they do a very good job. The, the Calc BC um, mm -hmm. isn't every other year kind of thing because they just don't have enough kids to take it. So um, they have to kind of group the kids in. And the Physics 2 is a little bit like BC is that, you know, there's really only three to eight kids a year. Mm -hmm. And they now have to pay for that. Um, and so that's one of the big issues. AP Chem, though, unfortunately, um, there's some, some high schools, because I have centers all over the South Bay. There are some mm -hmm. high schools, AP Chem is the biggest course. And then there are some courses that AP Chem is, is nowhere to be found. And it's almost always on the strength of the chemistry honors tutor, a teacher. Okay. Okay. Because if, if you don't have a good entry, yeah. you're not going to have that follow through. Okay. Got it. That's a good point. I, I see. So I only see you as iPhone. I see your I'm hands up. Go ahead and read it. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm on my phone today. <laughs> um, I, I have to go because it's a little bit past eight. But okay. um, well, thank you for hosting this. And it's, it's really great to hear from community members. I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, the, the only thing that I did kind of want to to chip in with is um so I, i'm getting kind of nervous saying this because i don't really know very many of you at all but um coming from a low-income background growing up in the central valley um and then um coming here to the bay um I just, so my mom is also a teacher and she teaches in the Central Valley. And I just wanted to kind of remind ourselves just like what an amazing privilege it is for us to even be having these conversations about where we are as a district. Um, in my mom's district, very rural, super transient area, mostly seasonal farm workers. Um, they got, well, my mom hasn't done any teaching at all. Um, their district put together, I think it was two packets to send home to families and that was it. Those children have had no contact with their teachers and no educational experiences really at all um, and, and no accountability. And so just like, I know that we're frustrated with where we are, but we are so far beyond what other students are experiencing across the state. Um, so just wanted to like name that as something because I think sometimes it, it's easy to lose perspective as well. Um, but, but I think it's also important for us to remember that too. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I thank you. You're right. I mean, there's a lot that we did do have in place that others don't. And um, I, I think there are pockets that not unlike your mom's area, we're just unable to do anything. Um, and they'll have that much more to work on when they do get to reopen as a result, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. But I, I, it, it is important to have these conversations. I think it's important. For, um, I really wish the district would have a town hall meeting to have this kind of a conversation. And I know the, the concern um, when I talked to Patrick Bernhard is, you know, it's, they're just feeling like they're going to be bombarded with questions because just in the um, board meetings, people will be entering things instead of a question to, instead of something to comment on um, during public comment, they're, they're seeing a lot of questions pop up in the, like more than 300 in the board, meet, board meetings. And they're wondering how that's going to translate in a town hall meeting. And I think 
if they, they put out there, we want to have a town hall meeting, but we know that there's a lot of questions. So, you know, we will take questions and then they could have someone go through the questions and consolidate them and address the key issues that are being asked about. I think that would be at least one way to take it. But I, I just, um, I've, I'm still feeling a lot of parents responding as if they're not being heard and wanting conversations like this and they're happening in individual threads and sometimes um, you just don't get the answers that way. So I, I, it's, it's frustrating. I really hope that a town hall meeting will happen because I, I think hearing it from the horse's mouth is a lot better than hearing it from my mouth. I'm not on the board yet. It's just a hope for the fall. And, and um, if you live in 95125 zip code, I would appreciate your vote. Um, but uh, these conversations are going to be key moving forward. And I, I, they need to be at the board level for sure. And if they had one, there would be an initial onslaught. It would be ugly as could be. Sure. And then the second one would be probably a little bit less. And then the third one would be a little bit less. And then after a couple of months, they would, they yeah. would taper off. Yeah. I but agree. if you don't ever have one, all you're going to do is build up greater resentment. So when you do have one, it's going to be really nasty. So, you well, know, the, if someone's, someone's not using decent, uh, good, good logic there. Eastside Union High School District had one in, in April totally appropriate you know this this is the plan this is why we have the plan this is why we're doing grades this is what our expectation was this is where we're at with technology you know is boom 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 all laid out and i think to have that honest open presentation um and then have that open it up to the questions i i think they answered so many questions in their presentation that they didn't hit a, get that bombardment you know and it was a great tactic and it was clear so certainly there's a way to do it, right? There's always a way, Mike, there's always a way. Any I other do questions? need to go, but thank, but thank you very much, Kristen. I appreciate you doing thank this. Thank you. Yes, we okay, have a good day. Half the hour. <laughs> thank you. All right, I think we're done then. I, any more questions or comments to share? No. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate your joining tonight. All right. We'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Also known as Scout. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. I appreciate everything you've done. Thank you. And if I was in your zip code, I'd vote for you. Oh, thank you. That's kind. I appreciate it.